So this thing on the left is uh, one of Shakespeare's sonnets written in chromacons, which is just like a color alphabet. I thought it was kind of neat. Um, so some years ago, I did a PhD, which I wouldn't necessarily recommend that experience to most people. Um, and my PhD focused a lot on color perception, human color perception, trying to understand the neural mechanisms behind how we see color. Um, and don't ask me about it, I don't remember pretty much anything about that experience, I've kind of blocked it out of my mind. But I then made a transition from academia into UX research, um, and my world started to look a lot more like this. And over the years, I've been able to work with a bunch of different companies and have a lot of really good experiences. And I found that at the beginning, especially um, because I was new to the field, I was doing a lot of reading of UX and marketing and design blog posts and articles and, and other things like that. And I was kind of appalled because I was seeing a lot of stuff that looked like this um, about color. Maybe you guys have seen this sort of thing before. It's like cute stuff that people like to share on Twitter and, and whatnot. There's a whole bunch of things going on here. Uh, like for example, I really like, did you know every color has a meaning and a feeling, which like, does it? <laughs> uh, or green is the easiest color for the eyes to process, which I don't even know what that could possibly mean. Um, it's definitely BS. Uh, I was seeing a lot of really like kind of provocative things like this, and it was really, really making me annoyed. I was not a big fan of, of this sort of stuff. Um, and so um, what I wanted to do today was talk a bit about the pop psychology of color, um, because I feel like a lot of what we are seeing in UX and design and marketing publications about color really is this kind of pop psychology that has little or no basis in actual science, um, or it completely misinterprets it um, if there is some science behind it. Um, and so it's really important because, I mean, I think to, to me, we rely on color for a lot of things in design. Um, it's a really important tool in our toolbox, right? We rely on color to um, convey meaning, for example. Uh, like here's a, a London tube map, and um, you know they're using different colors to, um, to denote the different lines in the tube. Um, we use color to attract attention and communicate priority. So here's a bad example of that. So this is George R. R. Martin's website. It's actually not the current website. It's a little bit better now, but you can see here that uh, there's not really a good job being done of using color to kind of show you where you should be looking and where you should be clicking and that sort of thing. Um, so we rely on color quite a lot to kind of um, attract people's attention to different parts of an interface. Um, and also to elicit associations. So, you know, we've seen a lot of red stop signs in our lives, and so we've kind of come to associate um, red with the idea of stopping. Um, and probably we expect to see something more like the picture on the top than the picture on the bottom. And of course, color looks nice, and we use it for that reason as well. Um, but basically, just color is a really important thing, and I think that it's really um, a good idea as designers and, and researchers and other UX people to kind of understand a little bit about what kind of what color is, and um, and kind of how to use it in maybe more scientifically grounded ways than you typically see um, on blog posts these days. Um, so today we're going to bust four color myths, four if we have time, three for sure. Hopefully we'll get through all four. Um, and hopefully this will be probably more of a, a fun talk than a practical talk, but there will be a few um, takeaways as well. Um, okay, so getting down to the first one. Um, so the first is that color is a physical phenomenon. It's something that exists out in the world. Um, it's kind of like a universal truth or property of an object. Like when I pointed that pink uh, box thing over there, like that is a property of that box. That's a, it's color. It, it wouldn't change. It's something that belongs to that box. Um, this may be something you you know you are familiar with or do or don't believe. Um, but today um, we're going to kind of talk about why that's not really the case. Um, so you might be familiar with the the phrase or the saying: If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Um, and the idea here is that if a tree falls in the forest, it creates um, these waves that travel through the air. And it's not until there's a perceiver or a receiver on the other end, um, an ear basically in a brain, um, does the sound, like the kind of sensation of sound actually take place. And so if, if there's no perceiver, there is no sound. Um, and what I would suggest is that if a tree falls in the forest and there's nobody around to see it, does it make a color? Um, the same sort of idea, um, without having a perceiver on the other end, there is no color that's just kind of there existing out in the world. And this might be a little bit hard to, <laughs> to wrap your mind around or hard to think about. Um, yeah, so I think that, you know, in general, the idea I want to get across is that color is a mental phenomenon. It exists only in our brains. 
Um, and I know what you guys are thinking, like we've been taught in science class, right? There's like this electromagnetic spectrum and there's a sliver of it that's the visible light portion of it. And there's this kind of rainbow of colors that exists in there. And we, when we look at light, those colors are kind of coming to our eyes. If we shine a light through a prism, the rainbow comes out, right? And um, we kind of get this idea that, um, you know, there's Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. These are the colors that make up light. Um, but unfortunately, we've all been taught lies. This is not, <laughs> not true at all. <laughs> so color appearance is not just light wavelength. It's not just that physical stimulus. Um, so here's kind of like a, you know, that, that rainbow, I guess, and those numbers on the bottom are different wavelengths of light, basically. Um, and what I want to do today, I guess, first is kind of walk through some neat illusions that demonstrate a few things. One, that two identical wavelengths can appear different. Um, so two physically identical stimuli can appear different. Um, two different wavelengths can appear identical. Um, and two different people can interpret the same identical wavelength differently. Okay, so the first one. So this, I've got Hello, UX New Zealand 2019. Um, the first, the top two are written in greenish color and the bottom two are in orangish color. This is not the illusion yet. Uh, <laughs> And so if I put a, you know, some context or some background there, you might see a bit of a difference between like the Hello and the UX and the New Zealand and the 2019, maybe a little bit. Um, but what, it, what I can do is layer on more context and really change the color appearance quite a lot, right? I saw a couple of people do this, so it means it worked. Okay, good. And I've just, this is literally made in Keynote. Like there's nothing fancy going on, right? These are just like yellow and purple bars either overlaid or underlaid over those words and it changes the color appearance dramatically. And the light that's coming to your eyes from those, you know, those bluish and greenish looking portions of those words is actually identical um, and it's the same as what was coming to your eyes before, but it obviously looks very different now. And I can kind of try to prove it to you by connecting um, the, you know, the, the bars, I guess, to show it really is the exact same thing. Um, so yeah, so here <laughs> is a situation um, where uh, two identical wavelengths, they're identical physical stimuli, look very different to us. Okay, so what I want you to do is to stare at the cross in the center of the screen here um, for a few seconds, um, and I'm gonna, in a, in a sec, flip it over to a different slide. So keep staring at that cross, and if I flip it over, maybe you saw a color illusion? Maybe a little bit, let's try it one more time. I'll put it up for longer. It's kind of hard, sometimes the lighting is a little bit too bright in here maybe, but just kind of keep staring at that, that cross in the center and what should happen is when I flip over to the next image, it'll be a black and white image, but it should look colorful to you at least for a couple of seconds. Oh, that was better, oh good, that's the reaction I wanted, yeah. <laughs> and so here, the wavelength is coming to your, you know, this physical stimulus is obviously, it's not, it's not colored, but the perception we got was as if a bunch of, you know, quote unquote, colorful wavelengths, I suppose, were coming to our eyes, right? Um, pretty cool stuff. Um, do you guys remember the dress controversy? <laughs> I also had to work Broad City into the presentation for sure. Um, so this was this kind of uh, big thing that exploded on Twitter and elsewhere, this idea that there was this picture taken of a dress and some people interpreted it as white and, uh, was it blue, blue and black? And some people interpreted it as white and gold. People were freaking out about it. Taylor Swift is like, it's gotta be blue and black. And Anna Kendrick is like, it's gotta be white and gold. And you know, I like Mindy Kaling is like, I'm thinking I'm getting so mad about the dress because it's an assault on what I believe is objective truth, which like, yeah, I mean, this is a situation where, you know, different people could look at the same image um, and get a very different impression of what the what the color will be, which is um, which is really, really fascinating. Um, we can talk more about the reasons why this happened, maybe in the, the break or something like that. Um, so I hope that these are kind of give you the idea that, you know, color is not something that is, you know, kind of unchanging or, or there as like a physical property of the world. Of course, there's a physical stimulus. We need light to have color. Um, but so much of what is happening is going on in our brains. And, um, and there's a lot of kind of context dependent stuff that, that's going on here. Um, and so I think that as UXers, like this is mostly, this is mostly just kind of like a cool, sciencey fact to like to absorb, I guess. But um, I think that understanding that color is a mental phenomenon is a great first step towards understanding just how context dependent um, color is. Um, and we'll talk about context a lot more. So let's talk about the second um, myth I wanted to talk about, um, which is that some colors are universally better at attracting attention than others. And so the reason why I, I started thinking about this was I was, I don't know, I think I was looking at a bunch of marketing related stuff and there's like a bunch of articles talking about um, like kind of almost like A-B testing different button colors for conversion. 
for some reason it was always red versus green. I don't know why anybody ever thought to try a diff different color, but um, there was this kind of idea that um, there'd be one color that would be kind of universally the best color to use if you want someone to click on something. Um, and so rather than, rather than this idea that some colors are universally better at attracting attention than others, I would say that the color that will attract attention the best really depends on the surrounding context around it. Any color can be attention grabbing depending on the surrounding context. Um, so for example, oh, so here's a good, a good tweet. Um, so bright yellow apple or banana means I'm delicious, eat me. Bright yellow wasp or snake, I'm venomous, leave me alone. So the language of color is not universal and this is very upsetting for, <laughs> for designers. Um, and so, yeah, so, <laughs> so maybe a plum colored wire is fine when the context surrounding it is red or green or orange or whatever, but maybe in the context of midnight blue wires, it's probably not the color you want to pick um, for the, the most important wire, I suppose. Um, and so the sorts of things I was seeing were, for example, I'm sorry that, by the way, I'm sorry that the image is kind of small and blurry. I couldn't find anything larger, um, but they're, they're A-B testing two different versions. One looked like this, and the, the button below is kind of just shown as an example, kind of blown up. And so there's like the, the green button version and the red button version, and they found that um, there was a 21% increase in conversion when they used the red button instead of the green one. Okay, wow, maybe that's cool. Um, another example, so same sort of thing, there's a green version and there's a red version, and they found a 72% increase in conversion when they use the red button versus using the green button. So like, what happens? Did we all go and make all of our buttons red? Like, did we really learn something from this? I think that's the conclusion that they were trying to draw in the article that I was looking at. Um, but there's some other things going on here, right? So here's the green version of stuff and here's the red version of stuff and hopefully you'll notice that um, in the green version, there's a lot of other green stuff that's maybe competing for people's attention, right? It's not just that get started now button or whatever. There's other green elements, other highlighted words, part of the logo in the bottom one, that sort of thing. Um, whereas in the right-hand side, there's not a lot of other red stuff that's competing for people's attention. So the red kind of stands out in that context better than, um, than before. And so what I really wish is that people who are writing these sorts of articles would maybe think a little bit more deeply and not just try to get this like one little finding out there and think about what would happen if they tried other colors or just kind of acknowledge the fact that the, the context in which a color is embedded can really have a big impact um, on what people see and pay attention to. Um, so for example, if you're, you know, if you're making a website for a basketball team and they're like the green team, uh, you probably would be okay using a red button. That would probably be great. But if it was a red colored team, maybe a green button would be way better than using a red button. There's no universal hard and fast rules here. Um, so it's not that there's some colors that are better at attracting attention than others. It's really a context dependent sort of thing. And so I guess, you know, in general, when we choose colors, especially ones to attract attention, we want to make sure we consider how they look when they're embedded in the surrounding context. Okay, the third myth. Let's see what this one is. Ah, uh, yeah, okay, this, this kind of goes back to uh, all that crazy, you know, claims and stuff I was throwing at you on the second or third slide. So a lot of colors are scientifically proven to elicit specific behavioral or, I guess, emotional um, responses. Um, and so I mean things like this. The one on the right I see all the time. I feel like it's being tweeted all the time. I love the one on the left. What color emotion does your front door evoke? Like, what does that even mean? <laughs> um, and this color emotion guide on the right. Um, and so this sort of stuff, like, is this really a thing? Are things really happening here? Um, and so rather than this myth, I think I would suggest that there's actually very few reliable examples of colors eliciting some sort of behavioral or emotional effect. Not zero examples, but it's much more limited than I think what figures and graphs like that um, try to um, suggest. Um, and so here's, uh, <laughs> here's a, you guys might have seen this one on Twitter as well. Um, and so it's a children's hospital and they painted a, <laughs> a path on the floor in red. And uh, the person below is like, literally any other color would have been a better choice, guys, which I think is a good, a good comment. But it caused a bit of a, you know, people were arguing about this. You know, someone posts something kind of like the sort of stuff I was showing in the previous slide, like, no, no, red's got all these really positive associations. You know, I'd like to point out that the color red has more positive than negative meanings, which, okay, does the number of different meanings matter here? I'm not really sure. Um, and then I like this tweet, uh, color theorist here, a bold red streak of wandering red through the hospital floor conveys the message, this is blood on the floor. <laughs> like, 
And the, <laughs> the idea here is that, again, this is all so context dependent, right? Um, all that kind of flowery, fun stuff we saw in the previous slides of orange being about optimism and whatever, like there's, there's all these you know, associations we, we might think that we have with different colors, but, um, but context is really, really important. And I want to walk through a couple of maybe more, I don't know, sinister in a way examples because they claim to have been going through actual research, but they haven't been. So here's a quote from a blog post. Another example has to do with the color pink, which is thought to have calming effects. According to research published in the Journal of Orthomolecular Psychiatry, scientists discovered that when a person sees pink, it slows people's endocrine systems and relaxes tense muscles. In other words, pink is associated with the idea of relief. OK, that sounds interesting, maybe. Um, they actually linked to the research, which is really cool. So I clicked the link, and I found out that that's not what the research said at all. Um, they basically had people um, look at, at different colors. They were measuring blood pressure, pulse rate, grip strength, all this stuff that they're talking about kind of associated with relief somehow, monitored all these different things. And they basically found no signif significant differences at all. The only difference they found was in a cognitive test. And they, they actually figured out that the, the difference they found was due to a practice effect of people not getting the right counterbalance of, of the different conditions. So basically, all the different things that are being claimed in this blog post um, are not true. And you kind of think that because they're linking to the research, you assume that um, they've done their homework here, but they really, really haven't. Um, here's another example. So this is a quote from a blog post. Uh, Color is the primary reason why a consumer chooses a certain product. That's potentially interesting. Um, where, where is the re they link to some research. Cool. And what does the research say? When asked to approximate the importance of color when buying products, 84.7% of the total respondents think that color accounts for more than half among the various factors important for choosing products. They basically asked people, is color important to you in choosing products? And they were like, yes. And wh who cares? <laughs> no, we know as UX researchers, designers, whatever, that people, you know, we often have very little access to why we make decisions and why we do things. I don't know why I buy a particular product. Maybe sometimes it's about the color. But the fact that the way they thought they could kind of science this was by asking people whether they think color is important in making decisions, and people said yes. Like that's really not a, a good uh, set of evidence to back up the claim that color is the primary reason why consumers choose a certain product. Um, so going back to you know to these these silly examples, like what color emotion does your front door evoke? Does that mean are they trying to suggest that when I walk through someone's door and it's yellow, I become more optimistic somehow, or when I see like the the, the Hooters logo, I <laughs> I feel more confident? Like you know things like that. Like what does this even mean? I guess what I'm trying to say is when you see these sorts of things and they exist you know everywhere, um, really kind of think a bit more deeply about you know what is being said here and what they're trying to claim. Are they actually trying to claim that by seeing these colors, it changes your mood or changes your kind of orientation towards a company. And there's like really very little evidence that this is actually um, happening. Um, right, so I, I don't think it's the case that a lot of colors are scientifically proven to elicit these specific behavioral or emotional responses. There's actually not a lot of evidence for this sort of thing. Um, and here's a great quote from Pavel Samsonov. He tweeted this, when making design decisions, context outweighs abstract theory. I think this is a really good thing to keep in mind. Context is so, so, so important for pretty much everything, including how we interpret different colors. And so I guess what I would implore you guys to do is just kind of dig a bit deeper into what, um, you know, what claims people are making. Try to access the primary research whenever possible. I know it's not always very easy. Um, but if you are really curious, you know, writing to the person who wrote the re as someone who's published research papers, just write to the person. If you can't get a free version of something and ask, and they will definitely send it to you because they'll be thrilled that you actually came across their research somehow. <laughs> OK, we have time for the last one, which is great. Um, so the fourth one is we are consciously aware of our color preferences. Like I, you know, I know what colors I maybe like or don't like. Um, you know, these are maybe fairly strong preferences for me. Maybe it's not the case for you. Not everyone really cares about about color preferences, but I think that some people feel like they know they know where their color preferences come from, maybe, and and they they feel like they're strong. Um, but I'm going to show you a couple of neat experiments that show how um, our color preferences can be really malleable. They can be pushed around really easily, and we might not even be aware of what our color preferences are. So here's, so this is um, Stanford uh, and Berkeley, two universities in California. Um, apparently, they have like a big rivalry. Uh, and so like, for example, at Berkeley, it's a socially acceptable and even desirable to shout, take off that red shirt when they see another Berkeley student wearing a Stanford red shirt on campus, especially on a big game night. So the idea that you know, <laughs> not only is this rivalry so strong, it even extends to like, don't wear the, col like, the colors of the opposite teams, you know, don't wear the opposite team's colors when you're on our campus or something like that. It's like a very, a very strong rivalry. Maybe this is not the case anymore, but at least when this article was written a few years ago, that apparently was the case. 
Um, and so what they, there's an experiment they did. Um, what they did was they had people come into the lab and rate their preferences for 40 colors. So this was kind of very much not in the context of any sort of sports thing or rivalry thing or whatever. Just, you know, students like to do psychology experiments to make a bit of money, come in and do some, some color preference rating, um, kind of you know, divorced from any of this idea of, of school's stuff. Um, and then after they did the color preference rating, um, people, the students were given a survey about their level of school spirits. So they're asked a lot of questions about you know, how much they care about these sports teams and you know, do they go to games and all this kind of stuff. Um, and so uh, what they kind of wanted to figure out was whether people's color preferences um, would, would kind of change depending on what school they, were, they happened to go to. So they had, actually had Stanford students and Berkeley students participate and whether this would be related to their school spirit. Um, and so here's a kind of simplified graph that will show the results. So we've got the Stanford students on the left and the Berkeley students on the right. And so for the Stanford students, um, they really like Stanford red and they don't so much like Berkeley blue. Um, and then for the Berkeley students, they don't so much like Stanford Red, but they do really like Berkeley Blue. And they actually, the students had no idea that, you know, the kind of debrief students after, they had no idea this was at all related to anything school spirit stuff. They, they didn't have a reason to say why they had these color preferences. Um, and so even in this kind of neutral context, people preferred their, their school's colors and disliked the rival school's colors. Um, and then what was interesting is the effect was greatest for the people who were most emotionally invested in the rivalry. So the people who um, really did care about their teams and whatever had these strong preference differences, um, even though they didn't recognize that the experiment was all related to that sort of thing, um, which is really, really neat. So maybe this kind of exposure or familiarity or whatever to a certain color could drive color preferences, even if you have no idea why that's, that's the case. And then probably a kind of a weirder example. So pushing around people's color preferences um, kind of in a, on a short-term basis. So this is an experiment where um, participants came into the lab and they would be sitting in front of a computer and on the computer would be just a computer screen and they'd see a color. And then for maybe one second, they'd see like yellow and it would go away and they'd see, you know, kind of magenta color, then pink and so on. So they just sit in front of a computer for like, I don't know, half an hour or something like that, just seeing colors presented at them one after another, probably kind of boring. Um, and so after they, they did this for quite a long period of time, um, well, oh, sorry, I should mention that one thing that this, the participants did not know is that there was a special ordering of these colors. So they seem maybe random to people, um, but there was actually an order. So for example, yellow, magenta, and pink were always presented one after another, um, and green, blue, and gold were always presented one after another, and so on. Um, and so over time, they were only seeing one color at a time. They didn't know that these were sort of grouped in these little triplets that were repeating over and over again. Um, and what was interesting was at the end of the study, they, they showed people kind of all at once these different triplets. So now they're actually showing those three colors together and the other three colors together. And one of those triplets would be one they actually saw in the study kind of, and the other would be one they, they never would have seen before. And people greatly preferred the ones they had seen in the study, uh, even though they had no idea why. You could ask them why they liked that grouping of colors better than the other one, and they could not say why, it was, why they liked it better. Um, and so here's a situation where all it took was maybe like half an hour or an hour or something of being shown some colors in the lab, and their brains are just kind of taking in this information and creating color preferences that are really not tied to you know, any kind of conscious awareness or anything that's really based in, um, in, in reality. So I think that, I mean, of course we can be consciously aware. I, I, you know what, this is actually too strong. We can be consciously aware of our color preferences. I know I like blue and I like green and whatnot, um, but that's not the only kind of situation. There are probably situations in which um, we, our color preferences have been pushed around and they're not really things we're aware of anymore. Um, and I think that's the kind of more interesting piece of this. Okay, so to sum up, so color is a mental phenomenon, not a physical one. This is the hardest thing to kind of absorb. Um, but wavelength, you know, the physical stimulus, you need, you need light, but that's only one potential factor in color appearance. There's so much other stuff going on in our brains besides um, looking at a light. And when you're picking color to uh, attract attention, it's not like there's a universal truth. It's not like you always have to pick red or green or whatever. You really want to keep in mind the context of, um, of what you're embedding that color into. There's a lot of associations between colors and concepts or emotions, um, and they're cited really frequently in the literature, um, but the actual evidence is really lacking, um, and you really need to kind of dig deeper um, beyond just the blog post level or the podcast level to figure out what's actually going on here. And then finally, color preferences are malleable, they're unconscious, and I think they're pretty fascinating. Um, and so I hope, that, I hope that you guys think so too now. <laughs> Thank you.